Nice to meet you. My apologies for the delay. Gosh, no, that's okay. No problem. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to speak with us this morning. Um, so I'm Val. This is uh, my colleague John. Hello. Hi, John. Hi. So we're extremely interested to speak with you on, on many fronts uh, today, but I'm going to try to contain myself and uh, focus on the, the topic at hand, which is um, what we're looking to do through the course that we're taking through NYU, right. so sol solving public problems with technology. And um, a little bit of a background on that is um, the, the course itself is a 12-week is program, and we have to pick something that we're very passionate about. Um, because this process in the course of the 12 weeks goes over things, you know, how, how do you actually deal with the problem? How do you problem solve? How do you go about design thinking? And so it really breaks down. It's, it's very informative. Uh -huh. um, so it's been a great learning process for us, but we discovered as public servants, um, you know, there's five of us in the group to come together about something that we're passionate about, and we chose uh, low-skilled workers. And in this particular case, we're going to focus on adult literacy. Um, and John might be able to provide a little bit more context on, on where we're at right now, just to give you a little bit of background on that. Sure, yeah. Uh, so as Val mentioned, we're, we're focusing on adult liter literacy. We're, we've noticed that, you know, I think there's a, I can pull a quote here, 48% of Canadians um, do not possess the literacy level required for full participation in the knowledge economy um, it, it is a you know one particular stat that jumped out to us and related to that we, we we've been talking with others we, we've been doing um, you know some some research uh, and there seems to be a few issues that have have jumped out at us there's this lack of a like a lifelong learning approach or a continuous learning approach so you get this um, we're finding that you get this kind of skills atrophy uh, that's one issue that we're noticing there's this misalignment between what what we're learning in school or in university and trades and uh, the current skills required for an evolving economy uh, particularly related to the knowledge economy and digital skills, for example. Um, and then there's the lack of investment um, as far as particularly small and, me and medium sized and enterprises go. Um, but all but also large, you know, like I think it's not sure. not just those. Um, um, there's I and we're you know we're trying to zero in. We don't know if it's like a lack of incentive, but but there and or, or maybe it's there, there's some myths and some assumptions that need to be challenged as far as the need for learning, um, who what 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 the skills gaps are. You know I think there's just shedding light on um, workers' skills, the current level, the benchmark, and what skills or organizations need. I think. There, there seems to be a gap there too. We're finding, so those are some of the those are some of the problems. We're not okay. we're not uh, certainly we're not certainly suggesting that we're going to solve all of those. <laughs> uh, the challenge of this course is actually, and and in particular, the complex problem that we chose is to scope it scope scope it down uh, sure. to like a manageable uh, problem, so we can at least. Uh, uh, try to to kind of develop design a solution that that will help really um, so that's kind of where where we're at in our research and in talk and talk and talking with folks like you right. um, and so if yeah we, we'd be fascinated to hear uh, your perspective um, of the problem and and potentially tell us a, a, li a little bit about kind of your solution or your approach sure. uh, to addressing it all right, and just just some caveats off the top because uh, you know I, I do have certain skills, abilities, and qualifications. But uh, you know, for many of the things that you have just mentioned, I'm not the expert by any means. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, for example, uh, in literacy education, there are many people who are, are much greater authorities than I am on, on literacy education. So as long as we understand that, you know, I'm coming from a certain perspective and background and uh, can't be, you know, the, the all-knowing oracle. Uh, uh, yep. you know, so uh, that won't stop me from expressing opinions. Great. <laughs> but but the, the important thing is that you do take them with a grain of salt and 
don't necessarily believe everything you hear from me. <laughs> that's okay, good. Yep, yeah, that, that's great. I mean, I think that for one of the main reasons we wanted to speak with you uh, in particular is because of what's being developed through NRC with the LPSS. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the reason uh, for us reaching out to you and, and just in, in my own sort of connection with NRC and the whole concept of open badges and using, you know, mm -hmm. being able to track and talent mapping and all this kind of thing. When I saw through the system uh, the automated competency development recognition, yeah. that to me was just very fascinating because when we think about how people learn um, and to, to sort of get into what they're good at and, and using technology as a means to sort of find find that gem of information, um, that's what really interested me. Um, so maybe there's an opportunity to, to speak about that? Sure, absolutely. Oh, yeah. great. So you, you had a set of questions that uh, you've sent me. I scanned them briefly. I tend not to linger <laughs> on questions that people send me ahead of time because I like to be surprised. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it takes away the surprise if I read the questions. But if you want to go through the questions, that's probably a good way to go. Okay. Well, the first one we were, we were talking about is um, in the development of the LPSS system, um, you must have at some point been in a sphere to, that you identified a problem. Mm -hmm. in order for the LPSS to, to be part of the solution. So I was wondering if you could describe what type of problem space you were in that the LPSS came in as, as the solution. Okay. The, I think, I mean, I, I have to put, put myself into the problem space of the work that I do generally. And the work that I do generally, what I'm really trying to address is access to learning, access to learning resources, access to learning opportunities, because there's, a barrier there and, and you know there are multiple barriers as we know um, you know in my own life I faced uh, economic barriers there are social barriers questions of expectations a whole range of things and my belief is that internet technologies allow us to put not just the the possibility the possibility of learning but also the potential of learning right in front of people yep. so so now what i've noticed and and this is where i begin with things like learning objects like uh you know 14 15 years ago and, and things like that but what i've noticed is that the development of learning management systems over time and over the last 20 years or so has focused more and more toward the institutional uh, institutional models. And the effect that they're having is to actually augment and reinforce those barriers. Uh, you, you get, for example, access to the capabilities of, of say, Blackboard only mm -hmm. if you pay tuition and go to a university. As well, um, I found, you know, just in, in discussions with a lot of people uh, who've used these systems and my own experience with these systems is that uh, they reinforce the institutional role in learning and de-emphasize the personal role in learning, which means that they, they are implicated in what I might over dramatically call learned helplessness. Uh, in order for education to be accessible to everybody at a certain point, people have to be able to educate themselves rather than have it provided for them. And you yeah. know, I'm not the first person to make this point, obviously, but you know, when, when we look at, uh, you know, not just nationally, but globally, what the, the cost and overhead required would be to provide an education for everybody who would need it and benefit from it, these costs are staggering. Mm -hmm. so, so we have to make education personally accessible, personally available, and structured in such a way that people can teach themselves. Uh, that doesn't mean no resources, it doesn't mean no support, it doesn't mean we cast them alone among the wolves, right? Yeah. Um, but it, it does mean they, they manage and develop and have the capacity to build on their own learning. And so that, that is the basic problem set I'm addressing. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And that concept of the predictive analytics for uh, learner development, I mean, that, that was really, um, that, that, that was one of the very first times that I've actually heard that, like being implemented mm -hmm. as technology. Um, are you able to speak about how that particular concept works? 
Um, yeah, um, I can use analogies here, um, <laughs> and 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 some good analogies because you know I mean it. it a lot of predictive and that analytics haven't actually been applied in a learning setting, mm -hmm. but but let me preface it by preface this by saying there's prescriptive analytics and there's prescriptive analytics. Um, the type of analytics deployed, for example, by uh, Desire to Learn, or now called Brightspace, with their Leap platform, these are analytics, when you look at them, they're addressed to help the teacher. Um, and, and they do things like they, they look at data points, uh, you know, everything from a simple data point to, you know, the number of times a student accesses the system to more complex data points having to do with the tracking, having to do with answers to questions, things like that. And they predict the probability, for example, that they will fail uh, or, or uh, that they will achieve a certain grade or that they will be weak in such and such an area. And this gives a mechanism for the teacher to offer supplementary materials, instruction support or whatever. Okay, interesting. Really valuable stuff. I, yeah. I mean, I go, we never undersell this. This is really useful. Yep. Um, you know, being able to identify the 10 people in your class most likely to fail is important. Uh, traditionally, classroom instructors could do this because they're right in front of the student. They can see, oh yeah, they missed 10 of their classes this year. They're probably yeah. not going to do well. Yeah. Uh, but but this moves it importantly from you know direct personal observation supported by intuition mm -hmm. to uh, you know uh, electronically collected data points supported by uh, analytical software that has been tested and verified. Yep. So I, I like that a lot. Um, the problem is it doesn't help with the agenda of empowering a person to learn for themselves. Mm -hmm. You see how this does not solve the problem I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. So now for the analogy bit. Um, I use an application on my phone, which is right here in fact, and I can even open it up because why not? We're on a video medium. Mm -hmm. um, and. And here it is, and you can see it here. It's going to take a few seconds to open because it's slow. It used to be fast, but you know, like everything. So it's called RunKeeper, and it has unknown issues these days with Google Play services. So, and what I do is I use it to track all of my learning activities. So uh, all my learning activity, all my exercise activities. I'm not a runner, obviously, but I am a cyclist. I'm an avid cyclist. Uh, I go to spin class regularly. I have a, a really nice bicycle. But what got me that way was I was just a cyclist, just doing it for relaxation and recreation. But when I started using this, I started getting feedback on my own performance. So, um, and it's telling me things like how far I've traveled, how fast I've traveled, how many calories I've, I've recorded. Uh, it's sharing this information with my friends, so it puts me into a social setting. Now, none of this yet is predictive analytics, but it's all analytics at this point, right? Um, so the predictive part really only comes right now in the setting of goals. And I have a goal, for example, to cycle for this year to cycle for 2,000 kilometers. And if you look at that, I have 80 kilometers to go. <laughs> uh, and it just kills me that it's pouring rain here. <laughs> so, um, so now the, the difference is, this is between Runkeeper and me. Now I go to spin class, there's an instructor in spin class, it builds my core strength, it builds my endurance, I suggest things that I can do. Um, but I do that, I'm motivated to do that because I have this personal learning thing going on that's meeting and setting things up to my goals. Now predictive analytics would take this a step further in this domain. Predictive analytics, if it wasn't cycling, if it was something that was more skill-oriented, or even if it's cycling, because you know you can cycle better or cycle worse, right? 
Uh, it would say, it would be able to tell me things like, um, maybe a simple thing. If you increased the daily frequency of your cycling, you could add a certain amount uh, to your uh, overall goal. Or, uh, you know, if you boosted your speed by such and such, but you, you could achieve your goal. But even better, right, if it, if, if it said something like, uh, you know, if you increase your RPMs going down hills, you can increase your speed and your time and your overall distance by X amount over the course of a year. So it's, it's analytics, it's predictive. Any of us could do the mathematical calculation. It's not really advanced in that way, but it's incredibly helpful, right? Because it's, yeah. now it's giving me a specific training tip. Mm -hmm. Cycle faster going down the hills. You've just been coasting, but if you cycle, you're going to get such and such a result. Mm -hmm. um, which is actually pretty good advice. Um, yeah. So that's what we want to roll out uh, in LPSS on the analytics side. But here's the problem another problem right mm -hmm. we don't know we don't actually know what the skill sets are in cycling that will increase your your uh, overall goal for the end of the year we can guess right and and some people will be in a better position to guess than others presumably the spin class guy will be much more likely than me to be able to guess you know like cycling going faster downhill will help improve my overall score but if I say it's just a guess, if he says it, it might just be a guess. Maybe it doesn't help at all. Who knows, right? So what we want to do is let's look at the performance. Now we use something like this. And we'll look at the performance of people who are actually good cyclists, i.e. not me, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, uh, the people who, like, I average 22, 23 kilometers an hour. I'm talking about the people who average 30 kilometers an hour, right? It's so depressing to watch these. Anyway, right? <laughs> what do they do when they train? Mm -hmm. All right. What did they, you know, and if we can do lifetime tracking, what did they do when they were averaging 23 kilometers an hour to get them to 30? We don't know, mm -hmm. right? Um, so... If we can look at actual performance, identify the, the points that they have in common, this would be a, a type of clustering analysis, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and that means we're gonna have to set up the data, we're gonna have to graph the data, then we're gonna have to run algorithms against those graphs in order to do a clustering analysis. Uh, it's a horrible, messy thing. And it's even messier because this is not a great big database like a learning management system. This yeah. is mine, belongs yeah. to me. It doesn't share unless I give it permission to share. So the analysis is going to be based on distributed and often partial data. So, but the difference is by accessing the personal data and not just the LMS data, we're going to get much better predictions. It's again, the comparison is if you looked at what we did in spin class, that's a certain amount of data and the instructor can look at what we do in spin class and give us advice on how to be better at spin class. But we wanna be better at cycling. So we have to look at actual cycling data to see what it takes to make somebody better. And the only way to do that is to focus on the person. You can't just focus on the class. It, it's too small a data set. You focus on the person and access that, you can make the predictions. That's down the road. That's what we're doing now mm -hmm. is we're setting up education so they're personal. Because, yeah. because the bulk, the bulk, pretty much every learning technology that exists now is based on the institutional model of classes and courses and standard texts and standard assignments, etc. It's not based on personal goals. It's not based based on, uh, on on personal metrics. So we need to move education from the class to the person. And then once we have that environment set up, we're able to do these analytics. And when you mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, when you mentioned about um the performance measurement 
um, it's almost like the, it can be split between skill and competency and the development between the two and the relationship between the two, because you'll always have high performers. And there, there's always a range of how people perform in the job. Yep. Would the intention then be to sort of earmark high performers to determine what makes them a high performer so that you can learn how, how they do their job well to yep. be able to hopefully translate that in a way that would help someone else? Like that kind of pathway, is that? Well, even, even a bit more deeply than that, we can address questions like, is there a distinction between skills and, and competencies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is it, how much of performance is based on your innate ability and how much of it can be learned? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't do mm -hmm. this examining a class, right? Yeah. It's because you don't have the measurements that are sufficiently fine grained. So, uh, but these are really serious questions because, you know, ultimately, you know, you want to get to, uh, as they say, the pointy end of the stick. If you're making training and personnel decisions, uh, if, if you see somebody with potential and you want to move them into a position, it's helpful to know whether they can be trained into that position or whether their skill level is going to limit their ability. That's really obvious in some cases, right? We, we don't put four foot people in basketball teams uh, because it doesn't matter how well we train them, there's gonna be an issue here. Uh, but you know, with some of the softer skills, um, it's a lot harder. Uh, take for example, you know, one of, one of my big challenges is having challenging meetings with colleagues. We call them fierce conversations. There's a whole training thing, right? So you need to be able to do that to be in management. You know, you, you got to tell people you know, this performance has to improve. This this problem has to be solved. So there's a skill to that, and, and they're running us through training on that. The question is, uh, if a person is shy, like I'm kind of a shy person when it when it comes to dealing with conflict. I really hate conflict. So if a person is shy. That might impact how well they can perform this task. But how much of that is based on innate shyness and, and even more importantly, the innate shyness of the person in question rather than just generically, because it's probably different for every person. And how much of that can be improved through training? That's a hard question. That's, that that's a really nasty question, but, but it has a lot to do with how yeah. successful the person will be in the new position. Yeah. So now that's not the kind of question we're going to solve this program. Let's yeah. be clear, right? Yeah. But that's the kind of question, this kind of approach will mm -hmm. ultimately give us the tools to address. Yeah. I think that's part of it. And, and that's, to me, what's, what is very interesting is that <clears throat> each individual has all this wealth of experience and, and like you said, potential. But it's uncovering those things. And, and this is what's interesting yeah. to me about like pathways and discovering yeah. these pathways is that these types of predictive analytics have the potential to uncover these types of things in a way that a person would not know that they could be yeah, good exactly. at other things. Uh, so that's hugely powerful, especially in today's knowledge economy and, and what we're looking at. And um, so if you're good at this one thing, you could also be good in five other things. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah That's exactly. big. Yeah. Yeah, it, it reminds me, and I haven't actually drawn this connection before, but back in the early days, uh, like 2003, I wrote an article called Educational Blogging. Uh, and it's, it's the use of blogs to teach people, uh, you know, to get them to write, to get them to share. Um, and there's a lot of advantages to that, which I imagine you think of, right? You're doing it in a public place, you're practicing writing, all of that. But the big question people ask is, uh, what do I write about? I have nothing to write about. My life is boring. Uh, you hear that a lot. And the advice that I gave people, actually it wasn't in that article, it was uh, How to Be Heard was the name of the article. I, I said, look around your, your room or your home and see what's there and write about that. Right? Yeah. And what I'm doing is trying to get them to do analytics on their lives. Yeah. Right. I'm trying to get them to look at the stuff they already like because mm -hmm. nobody sits in an empty room. Uh, maybe they only like TV. Well, then they can write about that. Uh, maybe they have a racquetball 
bracket, uh, you know, I don't know even what they look like, but uh, they could write about that. Um, or, you know, their camera is, you know, you, you can get the rest of it from there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, again, the sort of approach that this would take. It, it finds the hooks, if you will, in the data that's already there from a person's day-to-day, -day, even non-academic, even casual life that points the way to what probably is going to be their advantage or their skills in the future. And, and I think, I think, needs to be verified, if you hit that, if you catch that, if you let them and help them follow the things that really interest them, that addresses a lot of the issues of motivation um, and dedication to the learning that they need to do subsequently in order to be successful. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I know that there's, an, and in dealing in specifically with low skilled workers, and that, that's sort of where we're trying to, to put our focus because it's such a huge topic. Yeah. <laughs> Um, one of the things that we were discussing in one of our uh, group meetings is the concept of assessing previous learning or previous experience because life experience is not something to overlook either. No. And it's like how do you tie in sort of previous life experience uh, in a way to a low skilled worker that could again follow that same way to uncover other pathways and find what they're good at. Yeah. So there is potential I think to connect technology, even though somebody may not have a lot of the, the literacy skills, if you look at how to assess somebody through life experience as well as academic experience as well. So in your opinion, would you say that technology would still have a place in being able to assist low skilled workers or particularly those with literacy issues? Uh, well, short answer is yes. Uh, I, I do think so. The longer answer is yes, but it's not easy and it's not yes. automatic and there's a lot of other stuff that has to happen. Uh, I wrote a post today, you know, talking about how yet again another study has come out showing that the major predictor of, ec of educational outcomes is economic background. Um, you know, so, and that tells me that, you know, simply providing education to, pe to people does not translate into opportunity, that there are other social structural factors that also have to be addressed. So I'm really aware of that. And I'm aware of that because, you know, partially because of my own background, partially because of many of the people that I've worked with over the years, uh, you know, and, and, you know, on the face of it, it becomes pretty obvious that, you know, people who are coming from uh, a more impoverished background with less opportunities to begin with aren't going to see the potential for opportunities in the future. Yeah. Technology changes expectations. Uh, technology changes the range of possibility that we can see and that we can follow. Uh, you know, I, I think of people that I've worked with in Colombia, for example, who, who see what's happening in other countries and, and the sort of thing they say is, we should do that here. We don't have that here, but we should have that. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I've seen in First Nations communities, you know, it's the idea that, uh, you know, you can have heating in your house. Other people have this. Uh, I, I know that sounds like an awful example, but it's a real example. Um, mm -hmm. you know, um, or, you know, uh, people, people can become doctors and lawyers, even if they live in the country. Uh, it's not something that only the children of doctors and lawyers need to do anymore because people have this expectation though. So I think, you know, right off the bat, technology plays such a huge role in, in shaping a person's perceptions of what's possible. And, and I think that creates a lot of the motivation. And then the second part is technology provides or can provide because again, LMS technology hasn't done this really, but it can provide the mechanism that makes these now accessible. Uh, you can see that you could become a lawyer, uh, even if you live in, uh, I don't know, Hay River, uh, but and practically speaking, it's always been really hard to be a lawyer and you certainly couldn't do it without leaving the community. But now, possibly, you could, sometime in the future, become 
a lawyer while still working in in the 7-Eleven on the highway. Yeah. So it, it, it's, 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 it, it's a doable thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that opens up a lot of doors. Again, it's not an automatic. Uh, a lot of things have to happen. Uh, somebody working for 7-Eleven actually has to earn enough money to be able to solve the other problems in their lives, like, like housing, food, clothing, shelter. And, and they need to have examples and models in their community uh, you know, that inspire them to, to go this way as opposed to, I don't know, whatever, you know, uh, say uh, less satisfactory or less satisfying life outcomes might be, which is often the only example they see in their community. I'm yeah. picking on Hay River, but it's you know it's a problem that ranges everywhere from here in Moncton to the larger cities to the northern communities, and as as you know, worldwide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we've pretty much. Do you have any other other questions there? I mean, um, the reference to stakeholders. Yeah, I guess like we we were wondering about kind of the the uh, like the, you know the key players that that you see involved in this. It's interesting, um, you know, from governments to to other organizations. Go like gov governments right now. We see uh, you know with the Can Canada Job Grant, for example. It seems like on uh, in some cases it looks like it's going to be more on the employer to to provide um, the training. For example, to to low skilled wor workers, which uh, we we talked to someone just recently who had some concerns about that and and uh, where where that that would uh, get us in the end, and so that and and I gather, given your you know what you've already said about about the need to to more per personalize this, I was just wondering if you had any comments on on that, like current approaches to yeah. address the pro the problem, and if they are or not. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard question because there, there are many nuances to it. Uh, I used the word nuance, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, there, there's, there's a couple of things. Uh, I mean, and the first thing that enters my mind is it's fine to have employer led training unless you're unemployed, in which case it's, a, it's an issue. Uh, so right off the bat, there's the access issue. Um, one of the things I've been trying to tell companies uh, as, as one of the virtues of LPSS is that a mechanism like this is something that allows employers to provide training and learning to people who are not yet employees, but who are potential employees. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, this allows you to reach out to people who aren't yet qualified, but to, to show them that, you know, if you do this, this, and this, you could become qualified for employment in our company. And, and we're the ones offering the training, so it's le legit. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, and that, that's a pretty positive message. And, and uh, you know, especially uh, like companies where there are significant shortages of staff, they've responded well to, to that approach. Um, Another issue that people raise, I'm sure, because um, I've heard it myself, is just uh, the, the nature and content of the learning that takes place when it's provided by an employer. And yeah, quite right. Um, you know, uh, the, the companies are going to focus on skills and possibly equipment and, and applications that are specific to that company. And who would expect anything else that's different? If that was your only education, it would be a concern. Uh, you know, if, if you're going into a trade school, I worked at Assiniboine Community College, for example, and we'd have trade programs sponsored by employers. Uh, one of the ones, I'm trying to think of what it was, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a nursing, like a, a nursing program that we set up 
I forget exactly what's it, occupational health nursing or something like that. And that, that was set up specifically at the request of employers because they had a projected need in a marketplace for something like 24 people trained in just this way to fit into these positions that they knew were going to become vacant because of uh, staff turnover, retirement, population changes and the like. So, okay, yeah, assuming we set this thing up, uh, the people take this training, they come out two years later, they focus their entire effort on this training, it turns out there's only six positions available. Yes. Uh, you know, that's a real issue. Uh, yeah. So, if you're investing everything in the training program, then employer-led and offered training is a real problem. But, if a person is taking this training as part of the overall learning that you're doing, mm -hmm. then the risk isn't as great. First of all, the, the learning can migrate better because it's being done in the context of other learning. So they're qualified not just for these specific positions, but others. And you might need another course or two, but, but you can still migrate to another position. Um, so it becomes a safer option. Mm -hmm. and, and also, you know, if we're employing anything like open education, a less expensive option, something that they don't have to give up two years of their lives to work on, but something they can gradually work on, work toward. So it doesn't eliminate the problem completely. Uh, there's always going to be, you know, an aspect to corporate training that's a bit mercenary. Uh, and, and it's always going to be a risk but the risk now is much more balanced rather than so one-sided leaving you completely at the mercy of these job prospects once you've graduated and you know the other side of this and, and one of the one of the things that motivates me to work not just with students but also with employers is uh you know and the national post said it of all places the national post said it just a few weeks ago companies have been getting a free ride Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, they're benefiting a lot, and especially when they lobby for specific training programs like the one I've just described, mm -hmm. right? It seems reasonable that they want, they should be paying for this. I think it's reasonable. Um, you know, the employers who benefit from a well-educated, well-motivated population should pay the freight uh, mm -hmm. of making that happen. So the other side of what I do is I talk to employers about how do you get the best investment for this investment that you really should be making. And the best investment isn't to pay the, you know, to pay the cost of a two year training program at a Cinnamon Community College or anywhere in this one specific outcome. Uh, that's not the best way to do it. It's not the best way to do it because you're providing a lot more training than is probably necessary for the position because you're doing a lot of training just in case. Um, and you're, you're paying for people who are not actually on the job, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know, one of the main reasons why they don't want to pay for training, right? So there's a real need to integrate learning with actually working, learn, you know, and, and you, know, you can see that on the side of the employer, but also on the side of the employee. It's a huge barrier to have to stop working for two years or four years, or in my case, 10 years, uh, and go to school. Yeah, it's no, absolutely. So we need mechanisms to make that possible. And, you know, traditional distance education and online learning takes you a certain part of the way, mm -hmm. but actually having personal learning that integrates closely into the work that you're doing helps you turn your work experience into a learning experience and vice versa. Mm -hmm. See, that's very interesting. That ties into a lot of things about the whole concept of micro credentials. Mm -hmm. So rather than having like these large formal like certificates for diplomas, yeah. um, that you break it down into manageable micro credentials where people could say, this is what you need to have this job. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was very interesting because I think like in, in a lot of the research that we've done, it's very clear that there's a very di like there's a disconnect between education, government, you know, companies. Uh, so that sort of network, um, there are gaps. Things are broken, and yeah. kids coming out of school, whether it's high school, whether it's university, are not 
specifically job ready. Um, so just because they have a degree doesn't mean they're going to go out and get a job. And it seems more and more the concept of soft skill development mm -hmm. is as important yeah. as the actual skill because I think you had mentioned earlier, like knowledge can be taught. The, 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 you can be taught a, a new way of doing something or if you use mm -hmm. you know, SAP system or we're going to teach you something else. Well, nobody uh, can teach you SAP. <laughs> <laughs> you're either a sap whisperer or you're not. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just the concept kidding. of this concept of uh, these soft skill developments yeah. um, is something that that seems to be coming up a lot because yeah. it's almost a, it sets it sets people apart. Um, yeah. That if you yeah. have the ability to learn quickly, you can you, somebody can say go maybe not sap but go go learn this and that that yeah. is something that. That uh, is recognized. I think a lot of employers seem to be talking about that. Mm. I, I, I've also heard now a couple of times this like turn, turning these like turning the work experience into a learning experience. Like mm -hmm. um, so, it's even you don't you don't even know you're doing it almost. Um, that that's come up a couple of times too, and I'm fascinated. Like like is that is that what um, L LPSS like? Is there a functionality of that? Like, is that what you're doing? Um, we, we have a project called uh, Personal Learning Assistant, PLA. Okay. And uh, the way we describe it is that PLA is a projection of LPSS capacities into external environments. Typically, when we think about uh, online learning or e-learning, we think about people sitting in front of a computer screen like this. Yeah. Um, but for a long time, not just with LPSS, I've talked about the idea of being of learning being an infrastructure, a utility. Uh, I've used various examples, water and electricity, for for example, um, where you know I, I come into my office and I turn on the lights, and the lights help me see in order to do my work, right? Um, and so being having an illuminated space and being at work is pretty much one and the same thing. So having a learning space and being at work is also pretty much the same sort of thing. But even more more to the, you know to take that a step further, another utility that people don't really think about a whole lot is language. Mm -hmm. um, and and language is one of these utilities. It used to be really really scarce and hard to get. But now, language is all around you, um, just wherever you might happen to need it, right? You know, if I need to know what's inside this jar, for example, I've got language that will tell me what's inside this jar. Uh, uh, Madras curry, ready to grind. That tells me a couple of things. It tells me I have to grind it. It's something I should have read before I bought it. Uh, you know, it, it lists the ingredient. Incredibly useful, right? Well, learning should be available there as well. Uh, the learning should be in this jar, or at least the combination of this jar and my learning tool. Um, and and so you know, it's it's not simply mixing learning with work. It's mm -hmm. it's making learning an infrastructure utility available inside the work environment. And and so it's you know it's in devices. Um, you know, we we've worked on, for example, uh, what we call um, uh, a multimodal interactive trainer. It, it's a gun for police and and uh, and military. Uh, and the idea here is that when you're working with this gun, it's really cool. It shoots lasers and all of that. Uh, I've never used it actually, um, but I'm told it's really cool. But the idea is you're shooting lasers at targets and the system can record how well you're hitting your targets and all of that. The, the, that connects to the LPSS system. So you're getting performance analytics back, you're getting all the stuff that we talked about, but it should also be in real guns. Um, or, you know, uh, so that yeah. you're getting analytics back from right. the actual point of use so that you know because it's one thing to practice 
in, in a big building. It's another thing to practice in an actual environment. It's a, it's a horrible example. I don't really like yeah. guns at all. Nope. Uh, but but, but it's, it's, a, it's a real example. Yeah. Yeah. And even your cycling example, like you're integrating mm -hmm. the learning, using yeah. the device, you're integrating that in, into your routine yeah. and learning from the experience. Yeah. Right now I have to carry this thing around with me if I want to learn on my bike. Bicycles yeah. of the future will have these things built in. Yeah, no kidding. Right. Wait yeah. to see. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, there's even now there's a there's a whole product line from a company called Garmin, uh, and they focus almost specifically on the bicycle environment. And typically, you, know, you buy a bicycle, it comes with a headlamp and a tail light, you no know, illumination, right? Uh, it comes with instructions and writing, and and it'll come with the Garmin thing on it to track your performance. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. See, we we. We've picked a, a very complex problem with an even greater complexity in focusing in literacy because the concept of knowledge transfer relies greatly on the ability to be able to ingest information. Yeah. Um, so we're, I guess, at, at this point, and I, and I know given uh, your experience in, in learning, not particularly with adult literacy, but do you see that there is a potential to use this type of technologies in, in the way that we were talking today to that type of vulnerable group? I think so, but I think we have to be careful about how we phrase it. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about knowledge transfer, right? But in literacy, I think, I think you, you probably can't really transfer the knowledge of a language. It's the sort of thing that a person has to do for themselves. Yeah. That's what makes it really hard. Right? You mm -hmm. can't just tell them, you know, this is the word horse. Now you know this, right? And yeah. you know what, you know, it, it's, uh, and I think this is true of all knowledge and not just language learning. Uh, this is one of, one of the core uh, pedagogical theories, if you will, that, that I subscribe to. Um, and this, this is part of the reason why I think it's so important to put learning into the workplace. The idea here is that learning is supported by immersion into a context, yeah. uh, 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 into an authentic environment of use. Yeah. Uh, and I think the same is true of language. And, and it's, it's funny. Uh, Europeans tell me all the time, I've heard this story dozens of times, how Germans don't speak English um, as well as the Dutch. And the reason for that is there's so many more Germans than there are Dutch speakers. So TV programs, they're all dubbed. Uh, but in Germany, they're all dubbed. So the person is sitting there watching and, and hearing in German. Whereas in Holland, they're all subtitled because it's just not economically viable to pay the money to dub them. So it's interesting. So the Dutch people, when they're watching TV, they're being immersed in admittedly passive, but passive English learning, whereas the Germans are not. And the outcome of this is Dutch people learn English much more easily than German people. Now, that's apocryphal. You mm -hmm. really need to test that. And you know, like I say, I'm not an expert in literacy, yeah. so I'm telling you stories that I've heard. Yeah. But, but it seems pretty reasonable to me. and and. I'm pretty sure that it applies more generally. Uh, putting people in a context of use produces much more effective learning than not. And there, there's a variety of practical reasons for it. Uh, there's the motivation aspect. You actually need to know this right now. Uh, there's the, the repetition aspect to it. And there's I've seen quite a number of papers that talk about uh, not just presenting, but present and then delay and then present and then delay and then present and you, you can, and you tail it off and this iterative approach to learning where you repeat what it is creates longer learning results and that's not immersive but immersion produces that effect right so so it seems reasonable to me so i think that technology that people who are low literate are going to be using because Pretty much everyone's using technology anyways. And technology that is designed 
in order to support language learning in an immersive way, rather than like lessons and classes and things, yeah. like that, but in an immersive way, will have a positive effect on literacy. Cool. Uh, that's great. That's a good point. Yep. That's how I'd design it if I was building it. I mean, and it's true. I mean, I can't remember what the most recent statistic was from Comscore, but the amount of uh, the number of mobile phones that are currently like globally available mm -hmm. is it, it's almost like yeah. you know two phones per person in the world. It, 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 it's it, it, crazy. It, yeah, it is. Um, so that lends itself to to that other question too about technology and who has access to it. I think yeah. it's 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 like you said, finding that way to reach them in yeah. in a way that is meaningful. Because I absolutely agree that having these types of courses, these online kind of things that are, are traditional, probably won't work because they haven't really worked so far. Yeah, there's no evidence that they've worked in the past. There's no reason to suspect they'll start working in the future. Um, but we do know that immersive learning works really well. I mean, and there's so much evidence for that. Um, you know, I'm not, you know, for, for my own case, I know that, you know, learning French, for example, my knowledge of French dramatically increased when I started giving talks in French. Mm -hmm. Big surprise. And, you know, if I was to spend a month in France, not just as a tourist, but working and, and interacting with people, again, I see a similarly improved effect and that's why they do French immersion uh, and things like that too. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so yeah I, I was going to say something else but I forgot what the point was. <laughs> oh I hate doing that. <laughs> well this has been great. Uh, yeah, yeah very much so. Um, did you have anything else? I, to I think I'm no I think I'm good. I think thanks so much for for all the information and do, doing what you're doing, yeah. <laughs> you're welcome. It's my pleasure. It's and I'm good. very much excited to see uh, the LPSS. That it launched. Was it yesterday or the day before? Uh, well, we we put up the site October first, and then the, the the first actual invitations went out to people on the twenty first. So it was, okay, great. Well, actually, that's not true. It's it was supposed to be the twenty first. I think it was the twenty second. It wasn't okay. yesterday. Yesterday, I sat around the office and was lazy and didn't send <laughs> invitations. <laughs> so I need to remind myself send out some invitations today. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, be that's very awful. Much, <laughs> I'd be very interested in seeing how that develops and um, how we're aligning with the whole concept of open badges and all yeah. of that. Mm. Uh, so we we've got sort of two yeah. tracks on the go here, but both of which. Um, and feed into the same realm of information. That, uh, so it'll be interesting to follow in this course and see how that develops. So we can definitely keep you uh, in the loop on that, just if you're curious to see how, how things evolve in that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I'm always, any information from a wide and diverse array of sources, I'm always, always interested in. So. Excellent. Well, Great. thank you so much, Stephen, for taking the time to meet with us today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look forward to keeping in touch with you in the near future. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye.